this coming comes up. Good evening and welcome to our continuing study of the Gospels in our course, A Survey of the Gospels. We are in Unit 6, this being the 12th of October, uh, 2022. And in our first six weeks, we have gone through overall background information. We have looked at uh, where the Gospels have come from, what makes each one unique, how they relate to each other, what we know about common authorship, how things became part of the canon of Scripture, things of that nature. And then we spent a couple of weeks looking particularly at Mark's Gospel. You'll recall that we are looking at the Gospels in the order in which they were written, not the order in which they are found in the canon of Scripture, with Mark's Gospel being the first written. And now we begin in the Gospel of St. Matthew. Before we begin, we'll pray, but I also want to park a thought in your minds uh, to keep there while we are looking at Matthew's Gospel. When we finished our review of Mark's Gospel, we had talked a lot about the trajectory of the narrative, with the transfiguration being a uh, sort of an arch uh, capstone. Once Jesus turns towards Jerusalem, the narrative really changes. We also spoke about the Markan secret, about Jesus always uh, telling people when he does a work of power to not really talk about it. And we talked about the fact that in Mark's Gospel, uh, Jesus' own, whether it is his people or his disciples, uh, well, to be charitable, at best they struggle to recognize who he is as he is revealing his identity as Messiah. Uh, keep those themes in mind as we shift gears into Matthew, and keep one other thing in mind about Mark's Gospel. Jesus also makes it fairly clear in Mark's Gospel what he is doing in addition to showing up uh, and proclaiming Messiahship and the nearness of the kingdom. He is asserting authority. I want to take you back to the third chapter of Mark's Gospel. And uh, Jesus has interacted uh, with the crowd and the Pharisees basically the scribes and the Pharisees have accused him of doing works of power by invoking unholy powers. So we start here at chapter 3, verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. And when his friends heard it, they went out to seize him, for they said, He is beside himself. So people are saying he's crazy as well. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called to them and said, uh, said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he plunders his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said he has an unclean spirit. Now, we've got two things that happen there. One is Jesus saying he has come to bind the strong man. The stronger one has come. If you relate this to the 12th chapter in John's Gospel, where he makes clear now is the judgment of this world, and that he has come to bind Satan, we can see the dots getting connected here, that Jesus is the strong one throughout Mark. Jesus binds the unholy powers and therefore defines the uh, sin against the Holy Spirit being to assign God's work to the work of the devil. 
to deliberately deny God's power and assign God's power to an unholy power is one classical definition of the sin against the Holy Spirit that shall not be forgiven. But keep that theme in mind that the stronger one has come because now that we're in Matthew's Gospel, we're going to see how the coming of the stronger man, the stronger one, is a fulfillment of all of the prophecies in the Old Testament and that Jesus has come in an act of fulfillment. With that preview, let us go ahead and begin in prayer. The Lord be with you. And with our spirit. Heavenly Father, as we gather this night, uh, it is with grateful hearts that we recognize that you have called us together again, both in person and online. And we pray that in this gathering, uh, we may uh, be those who are gathered in your Son's name in a way that you promise you will be present, that you will send your Spirit to us in ways that will allow us to uh, gain new insights into you, and into your will for us, that in all things we may come to know you and love you and serve you, and in all things we may come to proclaim you to all whom we meet. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, I said at the tail end of that preview that Matthew focuses on Jesus as the fulfillment of the law and of prophecy. We have to go back to when we talked about the time of writing of the Gospels. Matthew writes to Jewish Christians who have been expelled from the synagogues. The best dating that uh, we can give to Matthew is somewhere around the year 85. Call it the mid-80s at any rate. So it's nearly contemporaneous with Luke and about two decades younger than Mark. So Mark's been around for a while, Another oral source tradition that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 15 as all the people who have seen the risen Christ, that's been around. Scholars sometimes call that oral source Q, quella in German, meaning source. Uh, there's been testimony going on for a long time. When Paul writes 1 Corinthians in the early 50s, early to mid 50s, this is before the writing of the first gospel and he is handing on what has been handed on to him. As we spoke earlier as well, uh, we believe that Matthew comes together on the basis of Mark and what we'll call Q, and then a separate uniquely Matthean source uh, who the church father Papias, uh, writing right at the turn of the first to second century, identifies to be James, Jesus' brother, Joseph's oldest son. Uh, kind of makes sense in this way. Uh, the infancy narrative, for example, of Jesus is uh, told from Joseph's perspective, how an angel comes to him in a dream. Uh, Papias is the same one who tells us that the infancy narrative of Luke being told from Mary's perspective is because Luke, who has interviewed witnesses, has spoken with the Virgin Mary and that she's the unique Lucan source in addition to Mark and Q. But let's look at how Matthew is organized because he has a much more complex organization than Mark. We start out with the introduction, an origin and infancy story of Jesus as the Messiah. This takes us well into chapter two. Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom Jesus' ministry and mission in Galilee, questioning of and opposition to Jesus. Christology, we'll come back to that, and ecclesiology, which is briefly Christology is the theology of who is the Messiah, what is the Messiah, who and what are the Christ. And then ecclesiology is what is the church? Uh, is it uh, the holy mystery we know and love and serve uh, as a gathering of Christ's people who incarnate him on earth? Is it an organization, a human organization with all its human failings? What does Jesus teach about who and what the church is? 
Uh, we then have Jesus' journey to and ministry in Jerusalem. Now note, this doesn't happen until chapter 19. Think back to Mark how early we start the journey to Jerusalem. Uh, we get the climax then being a longer narrative in Matthew of passion, death, and resurrection. Uh, a more complex uh, organization. And uh, let's look at what we know about the author. Uh, the gospel is traditionally attributed to Matthew, a tax collector among the 12, who either wrote the gospel or a collection of the Lord's sayings in Aramaic, with this gospel or collection being assembled in Greek by a Matthean community of Jewish Christians. Now, one of the early traditions is that Matthew just wrote down Jesus' sayings in Aramaic and that this was the gospel taken east by the disciple and apostle Thomas. And we get the Maratoma Church, which still exists on the west coast of India from Thomas. And perhaps also by the substitute apostle Matthias, who was uh, martyred in the east. Uh, but at any rate, whether or not you say Matthew is the same person as the tax collector Levi, and that this is the same person who sat down and wrote the whole gospel in Greek, we do have a, some kind of Aramaic underlying narrative. Whether Matthew expanded that, having seen Mark's gospel and said, hey, this is a really cool new genre, let's do something with it or whether a community gathered around Matthew did that, we will not know, absent one of the most spectacular archeological finds that we can imagine. It doesn't matter, however, because we end up in the same place. We get a genre that has been invented in effect by Mark, that is expanded and changed in ways that really expands how Jesus comes before us. For example, in Matthew, we get all these parables we don't get in Mark. They will become a feature in Luke as well. So if Luke is interviewing witnesses at about the same time that Matthew's gospel is written, we can see how there's a lot of talk and remembrance and testimony about how Jesus taught. Now, the language of this gospel reflects knowledge of Aramaic and Hebrew and draws on Mark and Q or a separate oral tradition from Q. It's possible there's more than one oral tradition. Matthew was written probably in the region of Antioch in Syria between 80 and 90. So let's just call it 85. A post-85 date is most likely after the Christians were expelled from synagogues by the Council of Jamnia. Now recall that the temple is destroyed by the Roman army in the year 70. Jerusalem is essentially destroyed. The Romans end up erecting a temple to Jupiter on the, the uh, ruins of the old temple. Uh, Christians have been in synagogues from the beginning. Post uh, destruction of temple, there is no temple cult. There is no pilgrimage to Jerusalem. There are no sacrificial cults going on in Jerusalem. Uh, or I should say singular, there is no sacrificial cult going on in Jerusalem in the temple. Uh, this raises the temperature between the followers of Jesus Christ and other members of the synagogue. Uh, the Pharisees, no longer centered in Jerusalem, are starting to give rise to what becomes rabbinic Judaism. We're starting to see what will eventually become the Talmud, but it's still quite early for that. The uh, Pharisaic tradition of how you parse the law is becoming more important in synagogue worship. And so people who have been known as Nazarenes or people of the way in Syria, Antioch, are first called Christians. And we get that testimony in the Acts of the Apostles that uh, it is around the time of the first mission journey. So call that, oh, nine to 10 years after Jesus' resurrection.
probably later than that actually, probably late 40s, that we start seeing people called Christians. That widens any divide in synagogues. The Council of Jamnia formally expels the Christians from synagogues. And so the Mathean theme of Jesus as the fulfillment of the law becomes very important in this context. Think of all the times in Matthew's Gospel something will happen, or Jesus will say something, and uh, the evangelist will say, this came about in order to fulfill the prophecy X, Y, or Z. Or, let's go to the Sermon on the Mount, where uh, Jesus says at Matthew 5, uh, 17, after he's been teaching for quite a while at this point, he says, Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, Paul is going to run with that in chapter 7 of Romans where he refers to Jesus as the end of the law using the Greek word telos. We get teleology from that. Telos meaning end in terms of fulfillment. Part of Paul's basic argument about the law, which he described as good and just and holy, but a stumbling block for us because we can't do it, is that it's good and just and holy, but we can't do it. But Jesus Christ, as the perfect one, the sinless one, God incarnate, can and does. He does fulfill the law, and therefore he can say nothing passes away. Or if we go back to the King James language, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass away. Uh, Jesus fulfills the law, and to the extent that we are identified in Christ through our faith, we are therefore justified, which means we can stand before the judgment seat. Because the one who stands before the judgment seat is Jesus, and we're identified in him. He happens to also be the judge. So we're doubly in good shape there. But the fulfillment of the law is an overriding Mathean theme. It's why we start out with this genealogy in chapter 1 that you, you know, you, Oh, it's not as bad as some of the ones in uh, the Old Testament, but, you know, this is the sort of thing you might throw at a seminary and the first time he has to read in public and has to go through the Jerusalem phone book. So it's, uh, there are a lot of names in there. Now, before I go on to the next slide, reactions so far, questions so far, or things you took away from Mark that now that we're talking about Matthew, you're saying, wait a minute, how do these connect? Anybody who has a, a comment <coughs> or a question? Well, okay then. We shall continue to uh, slide two. And as I said, the overarching themes in Matthew include the identification of Jesus as the Christ and the near approach of the kingdom of God which Jesus proclaims. Uh, and we should not separate these foci, okay? Uh, the identification of the Christ means that the kingdom is near. Now notice, it's not that the kingdom is delivered, right? This is why after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus withdraws, because what? People want to follow him around, make him king, have him kick the Romans out, provide bread, fish, probably circuses while we're at it. We'll throw in that Roman element. Jesus doesn't provide the kingdom to them or to us. He says that it has come near. It's an opt-in model. We have to choose the kingdom, commit ourselves to following Jesus. When he's going to take us places, we don't want to go. Because when he says, follow me, he's saying to the cross. Uh, the first six chapters here of Matthew include the account of of the birth and beginnings of Jesus, which include his genealogy and his birth, 
the visit of the wise men, the flight into Egypt, the slaughter of the innocents, and the return from Egypt, the preaching of John the Baptist, the baptism of Jesus and his temptation, the beginnings of Jesus' ministry and his calling of the disciples, and the Sermon on the Mount. Now notice, it is chapter 4, chapter 3, before we get to Jesus' baptism, and then chapter 4, his temptation. That's all in chapter 1 of Mark. We don't have all of this genealogy and narrative and visit of Magi and flight into Egypt and the slaughter of the innocents, etc., etc. We don't have preaching of John the Baptist being elaborated. Incidentally, Matthew, you'll note, refers to John as John the Baptist. Mark refers to him as John the Baptizer, using a, a participle in Greek. Uh, John is known theologically as the forerunner, the one who goes before Jesus and points to, to who he is, which is why in classical art, you will see John pointing. He's always pointing in the picture off stage, so to speak, or he might be pointing to a lamb. Now, let's take a quick look at the genealogy because there are four women referred to in the genealogy. In each case, there's something odd going on. And the inclusion of these women speaks to the fact that God's purpose will be fulfilled regardless of who he uses and including his direct intervention in creation. So we start out with Tamar, Tamar, depending on how you like to pronounce that, from Genesis 38, who is one who acts as a prostitute and seduces her father-in-law. And she is referred to in the uh, genealogy here. Uh, let's find it. Verse 3 after we've gone through Abraham and Jacob and Judah, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron and Hezron the father of Ram, we go on. So something quite unusual there, something quite irregular in violation of the law of Leviticus, which of course at the time of that has not been given. Uh, so technically not under the Levitical law, but it's clearly something quite a regular guy. Then we have Ruth, who's a foreigner, one of those dirty Moabites. Why are they dirty? Why are they considered unclean by the Jews? It's because the Moabites uh, come forth from the union of Lot and his daughter. Mm -hmm. And so they are the products, theoretically, of incest. And Ruth is a Moabite woman who seduces an Israelite, she seduces Boaz, and thereby becomes the grandmother of King David. Again, God using very irregular means to accomplish his purposes. This is all described in the book of Ruth, right? Then we have Bathsheba, who is described in the genealogy here, not by name at all, but just as the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And so we've jumped from grandmama Ruth, now down to David's mistress, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, whom David has murdered. And so we see a highly irregular liaison going, and we know that the firstborn of that union dies. And it's the secondborn of that union who becomes King Solomon. So the wife of Uriah the Hittite, who commits adultery with David. And then finally we get to Mary, and something irregular is going on here. Nothing bad, right? But she conceives directly by the Holy Spirit, by the direct intervention of God into his creation. And so when we go through this genealogy and get to the end of it and the birth of Jesus, the conception of Jesus, we see that there have been four things that have happened in that genealogy on the female side that are unusual, to put it mildly. And we know under the Mosaic law that Judaism descends on the female side, not on the male side. So what do we make of that? Anybody? Samson was the second son. 
Samson? Solomon. Solomon. That's the second son of David and Bathsheba. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the point here to any first century Jew listening to this is, hey, this is, you know, this would, in 20th century parlance, we would say you would prick up your ears like what's coming next. God is up to something is the point that Matthew is setting up here long before we get Jesus saying how he's up to something and fulfilling God's plan. This overall economy of salvation where we keep seeing God pointing to his purpose. Think back to, oh, the 15th chapter of Genesis when the Lord enters into a covenant with uh, Abraham and he has him split carcasses in two and then passes between them as a flaming torch. This is an ancient suzerainty treaty. Uh, the Lord has already promised Abraham inheritance, progeny, land, uh, and he seals this covenant, seals this promise in a way that in the ancient Near East, if you and your overlord entered into a covenant, the overlord would have you cut the animals in half and then you'd walk between the split halves with the clear message being, if this covenant is broken by you, this is what will happen to you. I will cut you in half. Except it's God, the overlord, who passes through the split animals. And then we go right from there to chapter 22, with the so-called Achedah, the sacrifice of Isaac. God will provide the ram in the thicket this points directly to the cross. So the setup here in the economy of salvation and God's uh, providence is from the get-go outside of the way things are normally done. God is acting directly and the narrative makes that particularly clear here. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, we get to the Sermon on the Mount and the sermon begins with Jesus teaching and preaching the gospel of the kingdom is what he calls it. The good news of the kingdom. Famously, the sermon includes the Beatitudes, the instruction that the disciples are to be salt and light, Jesus' self-identification as fulfilling the law, and teachings on a new ethical perspective in response to the advent of the kingdom. And then the sermon continues with instruction on works of piety. But let's look at a few verses in the sermon here because there's some that we're familiar enough with that they just are sort of comforting and we remember them and think, oh, nice. And there's some we just gloss over because they're just weird. And so we don't really pay time on them. We start out, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Park that for a minute. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those are the first two Beatitudes. What? What does that mean? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Huh? Think of 21st century culture. You're supposed to be, you know, assert yourself and deal in self-actualization. What does meekness mean? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Oh, we can get that. That sounds like a reward system. First three don't. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Okay, golden rule. Give what you get. Kind of get it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay, that sounds like a reward system. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Yes, let's give them a thumbs up and make a peace sign, right? Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Oops, that means if I'm persecuted and reviled for Jesus' sake, I am experiencing the kingdom? Hmm, is that kind of like following to the cross? I'm not sure I like that deal. Uh, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus says that if you give even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in my name, you shall receive a prophet's reward. 
Now, if we go back and look at how the prophets are rewarded, is that something we necessarily aspire to? When at the same time Jesus laments Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, you kill the prophets. Let's go back and just look at those first three that don't involve anything that look like a reward system. We start out, blessed are the poor in spirit. Well, if, and Luke says blessed are the poor, not the poor in spirit. When we get to Luke, we're going to see how he has what scholars refer to as a preferential option for the poor. He tends to just think that being poor, you don't have anything else, so you're closer to God. But in Matthew, poor in spirit, what he's talking about is when I recognize that there is nothing in me and in this world that will save me, that's when I'm poor in spirit. When I recognize that the gap between who I am and who God has created me and called me to be is unbridgeable by me, then I am poor in spirit and I am giving myself over to God's spirit to say, not my will, but yours. The poor in spirit are those who recognize their utter helplessness in the economy of salvation absent the free grace of God. Totally unmerited. I can't sit there and point to anything I've done or anything I am and say, well, I should get some consideration for this. I mean, at least give me a couple of eons off purgatory, right? You know, let's, let's you know, try to cut a deal. And we've seen people try to do that for well, millennia. But the poor in spirit are like when we have the Pharisee and the tax collector standing at the temple and the Pharisee is saying, I'm grateful I'm not like this tax collector. And the tax collector won't even raise his eyes and is saying, I'm unworthy. That's who's recognizing who, that God is in charge. We go on. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Notice he doesn't say what we're mourning about here. Are we mourning our loss of paradise? Are we mourning our loss of a loved one? Are we mourning our loss of something else? And again, if you go back to the church fathers, they would say we are mourning our fallen state, that there is this huge gulf between who we were called and created to be. In the primal Eden, where we you know, walked and talked with God in the garden, and who we are now. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Holy Spirit will come to those who recognize the gap. Finally, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Again, not those who say, my will, but who look for God's will. Some of the fiercest people we can look to in history are people we call saints. Their fierceness might not look like those mighty in battle, but standing before the emperor, standing before wild beasts. Think of the feast of saints uh, Perpetua and Felicity, or Perpetua and Company in, that's a summer feast, I think it's an August or July feast, but don't quote me on that, I'd have to look it up. You've got a 21-year-old woman, pregnant with her uh, teenage slave girl or servant girl, put in the arena in North Africa. Against Roman law, incidentally, it's illegal under Roman law to kill a pregnant woman. And they are killed by maddened cattle. Not a good way to go. They die holding hands and singing a Christian hymn. If that's not fierceness, I don't know what is. It doesn't look fierce in terms of being a berserker with a sword and, you know, a helmet, but think of uh, blessed Edith Stein in the 1940s in Auschwitz. Think of many of the saints we can name who were martyred. Now, as I say, we get a conclusion talking about works of piety. But then in chapters 7 through 12 of Matthew, we encounter what? The conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, 
including instruction on judging others and on constancy in prayer. Now, no, we're not to judge others, but that doesn't mean we're not to judge conduct. Not judging others means I can't say whether anybody is in right relationship with God and whether they will ultimately be saved or not. That's up to God. I can't judge it. None of us can. The church can't judge that. The church can, however, judge behavior and in fact is given explicit power to do so when Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to Peter in chapter 16 and says, what you bind on earth is bound in heaven. What you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So <clears throat> people who don't know scripture, people who mock faith are ready the, the one verse they know is judge not that you be not judged right and they're taking it grossly out of context uh, pronouns are important here jesus instructs against judgment of the person not of conduct using a second person plural form of address what we'd say in mississippi as y'all in the Greek of the gospel, human. Uh, but in giving examples of improper judgment, gives all of his examples using the second person singular, you, rather than y'all. And so again, when we see that the church is given the power to make some judgments, the church is given power to bind and loose in ways that we are not as individuals. We can't bind and loose, but we still can judge conduct, okay? Uh, Jesus is focused on judgment in the sense of whether or not a person is in right relationship with God and with whether or not uh, that person may enter the kingdom of heaven. His instruction here is not focused on the judgment of acceptable conduct but are you entering the kingdom of heaven or not, right? Uh, the sermon speaks to the costs of discipleship, to taking up the cross, to entering by the narrow gate. Uh, this is not just a get out of jail free card in the economy of monopoly. Uh, the sermon also enjoins that discipleship must bear fruit and that not all who confess Jesus as Lord are saved thereby. Now there's one that we try to gloss over, right? When we say I'm a good church going whatever denomination you want to name or I'm just I'm a good Christian, something like that. Jesus at uh, chapter 7 here, turn to the verse, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Oh, that sounds like that's directed to the church. Did we not prophesy in thy name and cast out demons in your name? Mighty works. And do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil doers. If you want to know what judgment on the church looks like, that's it. And uh, we're not in a position to point to anybody else in the church or any other denomination or church and say, those are the ones he's talking about. We cannot make that judgment. Uh, what about bearing fruit, though? Well, we're supposed to be salt and light, right? And uh, we are supposed to witness to others. Faith in our day and age, in our culture, has been relegated to a very private sphere. You can believe whatever you want. Just don't act on it in public, right? That's when you get in trouble. We are supposed to act on our faith in public as well as private and be prepared to share our faith. Now yesterday, at our men's breakfast, <clears throat> we had a devotional around the story of Philip the Evangelist, not to be confused with Philip the Apostle, always confused with him. 
But this is Philip the Evangelist, named as one of the first seven deacons in the sixth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. He's the one who baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch in Samaria. And uh, the eunuch is reading from chapter 35 in Isaiah, talking about the lamb being led to the slaughter. And Philip says, <clears throat> do you know what you're reading? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I if there's no one here to give me the sense of the scripture? So Philip does the same thing that Jesus does in the 24th chapter of Luke when he's walking down the road to Emmaus with the two disciples and they don't recognize him, he takes them back through the law and the prophets, all things that point to who he is. Philip does the same thing with the Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch says, hey, there's water here. What's to prevent me from being baptized? It happens. Okay, we sit there and we say, yes, but Philip has what? Philip uh, has the Holy Spirit prompting him to go over to the eunuch Philip has the Holy Spirit to give him the words, and we don't. How many times have you been called to maybe not go up to some stranger in a cafeteria and say, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, but to sit there and with somebody who gives you an opening because they ask you a question about what you do on Sunday to share your faith. That's a prompting of the Holy Spirit. Do we act on it? And when we act, we're worried about what do I have to know rather than what am I supposed to say now to share my own experience of faith? I would challenge anybody who's part of this class the way we challenged the men of the parish yesterday at the men's breakfast. We are equipped to do the same thing. We have received the Holy Spirit just as Philip, the evangelist, received the Holy Spirit. And uh, we are to bear fruit Part of the way we bear fruit is in how we witness to who God is and what his will for us is. Now I'm going to start on uh, the next slide and then we're going to take a, a break before we get to the reference to chapter 10. In chapters 8 and 11 we have uh, examples of Jesus' authority and of his invitation to follow, his invitation to opt into the kingdom. He exercises his authority, for example, in numerous healings. And this authority is recognized by others. For example, the centurion with a sick slave. Jesus makes clear that his invitation to follow involves self-sacrifice, taking up a cross. Now, let's be clear about one thing here. Most of us have had the experience of hearing uh, the sorrows of somebody else described. And it's the person who has a substance abusing spouse. Or it's the person who has uh, a family member with a gambling problem. Or it's a person who's got a way, you know, we could come up with our examples. Or, you know, an axe to grind at work. And they're working for them, yeah. And we hear sort of a pious platitude, well, we all have our cross to bear. That is a misconception of what Jesus is talking about. Those are burdens, not crosses. Burdens are things that are placed on us, not by something we have chosen to do. A cross is something that we take up willingly. What does Jesus say about burdens? Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, all ye that travail, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, for my burden is light. Jesus will bear our burdens. We take up our cross by choosing to follow Jesus. And what might that cross be? Well, it might be saying no to other things. Opportunities we might have like now there are good reasons I could skip Sunday worship, right? And, and ignore the first commandment and just say, oh, you know, the Packers have a home game and I'm going to go tailgate. And, you know, the game's not till 3 p.m., but i got to start tailgating at 10 a.m. and get things set up. And everything. This is not to say that there's a positive evil in NFL football, although when the NFL runs around and says, we own Sunday, you start wondering whether they're pushing the envelope there a little bit. 
Um, yeah, well, now they've got 9 a.m. broadcasts because of the games coming out of London the last two weeks. Uh, again, nothing wrong with football per se, but I have to choose worship on a Sunday morning to gather with those you know, partly in fulfillment of the first commandment rather than do something I might otherwise want to do. Now, I speak as one who has a long prior track record of ignoring such, you know, worship opportunities for things that I thought were better opportunities. There were times when I would be on a racing bicycle because there was so little traffic on a Sunday morning. And I'd be going through the hills and dales of upstate New York and Finger Lake country and thinking, I can commune with God out here in nature. Or there would be times when you'd be sitting there with the New York Times and a cup of coffee and a big sticky cinnamon bun and sort of just letting the day wash over you in ways that were less stressful than getting up and shaving and putting on a tie and going to church and having young children running around, etc., etc. Taking up our cross is something we do voluntarily. It is not a burden. On that sort of uh, note of sermon, we're at our halfway point, and we will take a break for a couple minutes and regroup. listening to Carlos Cardell from my car. Oh dear. Well, we're back. And uh, we're still in the process of sort of outlining what Matthew's up to here. We've got chapter 10. Uh, Matthew or Jesus, rather, teaching about mission. The mission and the commissioning of the disciples is described. Jesus describes what discipleship looks like and how it is rewarded. Uh, the picture is not one that you would just run out and say, uh, let's try to make ourselves popular here and we'll immediately draw adherence because it will look like sweetness and love. Uh, there are some very hard sayings, including, for example, at, uh, well, all these things where we're, you know, not supposed to take anything with us in mission. We're not supposed to worry about things. We are supposed to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. Uh, we're told that we will be, will be 
delivered to councils and will be flogged in synagogues and dragged before governors and kings for Jesus' sake and not to worry about what to say because the Spirit will give us the words. That brother will deliver up brother to death, father his child. Uh, I mean, again, this uh, is not exactly painting the sweetness and light picture. Uh, shaking the dust off of our sandals if necessary. Now, look at this bit, though. Uh, when Jesus commissions and sends out the twelve, he says, Preach as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says to heal. He says to cast out demons. Then he goes on, Take no gold, nor silver, nor copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff, for the laborer deserves his food. What are we supposed to have in order to engage in mission? Yeah, pretty much our faith. And our, uh, I mean, when we sit there as a parish vestry, and look at ministry in all parishes. I'm not throwing a stone in any particular parish. We tend to look at the glass half empty and think about what resources we have and can we raise the money to do this and how are we going to pay for it. When Jesus tells us when he sends us on mission, everything that you need in mission will be provided for you if you follow me faithfully. Uh, if we were to really do a bottom-up budget, we would enter into a very prayerful discernment process to say, where are we called in mission? To what are we called in mission? Then we'd start it and figure out what's needed and uh, keep working to uh, live into that vocation. Uh, Jesus makes clear in discipleship uh, any, every one of you who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. That starts looking a little bit like judgment, and he doubles down on it. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. Wait a minute. What about all the, you know, Charlie Brown Christmas and, you know, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Now, this sounds quite hyperbolic and in part is hyperbolic, but Jesus is making a point. We face a radical choice in choosing to follow Jesus Christ. And if we allow anyone around us to beguile us away from that choice, we are at risk of being judged to have denied Jesus Christ. Uh, he has not come to bring peace and affirm us just where we are as a happy family. Uh, and we have seen throughout history the examples of those who followed Jesus despite their family's wishes. Uh, in chapters 11 and 12, right after he sent the 12 out in mission, uh, he's finished instructing his 12 disciples and he goes on to preach and teach in the cities surrounding. And what happens first? John the Baptist is in prison and he hears about the deeds of the Christ. Notice that Matthew just calls him the Christ now. And he sends word by his own disciples to Jesus and they ask, are you he who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. 
and blessed is he who takes no offense at me. Now, Jesus is giving the answer. Tell him what you see. He'll remember Isaiah 35. He'll remember the bit about one of the, you know, the uh, Messiah shows up, the blind see, the deaf have their ears unstopped, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, etc., etc. Father Jeff made the point in a sermon recently about the curing of lepers that we only have two examples of this in all of Scripture uh, when Jesus shows up. The first is Miriam, the uh, sister of Moses, and the second is Naaman the Syrian. We don't have other examples of people being cured of lepers. The prophet says, this is what happens when the Messiah shows up. So when Jesus starts curing lepers, as he does with the 10 on the road to Jerusalem in Luke's gospel, those around him are supposed to really take notice if they know their scripture, right? Uh, so he says uh, who he is. And then he goes on and he's teaching to the uh, disciples or the people around him now about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to behold? A reed shaken by the wind? Why then did you go out to see a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, those who wear soft raiment are in king's houses. Why then did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. Truly I say to you, among those born of women there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Uh, we're supposed to wait for Elijah? Jesus goes on to say Elijah's here. Elijah's John. Read that whole chapter 11. Elijah's here. And then what do we do? We get into Jesus being rejected by his generation. There's a lot of teaching that happens in 11 here. By the time we get to 12, Jesus is challenged again. People don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear that, oh, well, yeah, Elijah did show up. Oh, and by the way, the Messiah is here. But the Messiah doesn't look like what you've been waiting for, who you've been Pharisees challenge Jesus' authority, attributing his power to the devil. And Jesus now reiterates that theme I teed up from Mark 3.27 of binding the strong man. Here we have Matthew's version at 12.22-37. Uh, the Pharisees are saying, uh, by the prince of demons, uh, and Jesus goes on and says, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. Uh, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not, he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, and he goes on to teach again about the sin against the Holy Spirit. That Markan theme comes in again now with the challenge against Jesus' authority. Uh, the strong man has arrived as the fulfillment of the prophecy and the law. So Mark teed up the theme of the strong one coming to bind Satan. Matthew clarifies that this involves the law and the prophecies being fulfilled. Uh, to ascribe God's power to forces of evil is to sin against the Holy Spirit. You are saying that the law and the prophets do not testify to this fulfillment. Now we get some good stories in here, a lot more stories than in Mark. Notable stories include the stilling of the storm. You'll recall that in 
Mark's version, the disciples say, who is this then that even the, you know, the wind and the sea obey him? And, you know, we're supposed to connect the dots and say, duh, you know, I mean, who uh, conquers chaos in the creation story, right? Uh, here we see, uh, let me find the verse. He's just raised the daughter of the ruler of the synagogue, and so he's just exercised dominion over death. He now cures blind men. Uh, he now cures a dumb demoniac. Oh, that's all in chapter 9. I'm sorry, I, I need to get back to the right chapter. Chapter 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Uh, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save, Lord, we are perishing. Contrast that with Mark's account. Master, wake up. Do you not even care that we are perishing? Here we're at least saying, Save, Lord. They're less clueless than in uh, Mark's gospel. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O men of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now, the uh, fact of the matter is, they still don't get it. But the, uh, they're a little more clued in in Matthew's account than in Mark's. So we have the stilling of the storm. We have the call of Matthew. Let's look at that one. Because this leads us to the whole issue of authorship being ascribed to Matthew. Uh, Jesus is uh, passing down the road, and as he passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. That's the sum total of the call. Tax collectors, remember, are real outsiders here because they are not only agents of the foreign occupying power, the Romans, they're also spies for the Herodians. They're the ones who have tabs on everything in the community. And they're notoriously corrupt. So just as in Mark we saw it's the outsiders who recognize who Jesus is, we see that reiterated here in Matthew. Uh, we get uh, a number of notable healings. I just referred to a few of them. In chapter 11, in response to John the Baptist's question regarding, him, regarding Jesus, as I said, the Lord identifies himself as Messiah by citing the works of the Messiah described in Isaiah 29 and 35 and 61. These works are undertaken in exercising authority over the law. Grain is plucked on the Sabbath. Jesus heals a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, while everybody's watching to see if he'll do this on the Sabbath, right? And what does he say in this context? That man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. Well, that's not gonna make the Pharisees happy, right? Now, time out for a minute. The Pharisees are the whipping boys in a lot of less informed uh, study in the church. They're just the, the, the sort of stock bad guys in a lot of things. Let's be fair to the Pharisees. What were the Pharisees trying to do? Maintain the law. Maintain the law. They were trying to be faithful. Mm -hmm. They understood God to have revealed his will for them in the law of Moses, as elaborated in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And so their goal was to attain to righteousness by observing the law. They're trying. They may not be trying the right way. They may, because of this, have uh, fallen very much into a sin of pride and scrupulosity and challenged Jesus and others on that basis. They may have made things mechanical. But this is not out of evil intent. This is not, you know, somebody sitting there and saying, I don't know, let's pluck the wings off flies and, you know, you know, drown kittens or something like that. 
any one of us uh, can fall into that trap. I have spent most of my uh, adult church life in Anglo-Catholic circles. And the great danger in Anglo-Catholic circles is when uh, people begin to worship the worship rather than to worship God. I have been to more than one church where things were done perfectly. Men and boys choirs, just the right bells and smoke, the music to die for, the everything, color, smell, everything, the preaching's even good, and the Holy Spirit hasn't shown up in years. And it's all about how we do things. I interviewed at the parish like that. It was tempting. The, uh, they didn't call me anyway, but the, uh, when we are tempted to get into a fuss over whether things are done correctly, we should remind ourselves of the example of the Pharisees. That doesn't mean we shouldn't take these things seriously and try to offer things to the greater glory of God and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, etc., etc. But when we start focusing on how we do things more than why and for whom, we've just become Pharisees with uh, a little bit more incense around. Now, uh, we also get the parables of the kingdom of heaven in chapter 13 and acknowledgement of Jesus by his disciples in chapter 13. So we have the sower uh, that's being explained to the disciples, the weeds or, and the tares, tares and the wheat, the weeds and the wheat, the treasure, the pearl and the dragnet. We don't get these parables elsewhere. Jesus likes to teach in parables in Matthew. And again, if we go back to theories of Matthean composition and say, well, you know, there's a series of Jesus' sayings in Aramaic, and they start getting knit together into the gospel using the genre developed by Mark and writing things in Koine Greek so that they can be widely disseminated. We can see how people remember those parables, in part because many of them are standing in the oral tradition from the named 12 who had the parables explained to them. Oh, here's how it works, right? Now, uh, when you get a story, even when you get a joke, when you tend to remember, right? You might even pass it along. This is what we call memes now. We're supposed to participate in the knowledge. So, by the time we get to chapter 18, Jesus is going to teach about community and life in community as a necessary ingredient of faith. But his focus here is on how the kingdom of heaven works in the world around us and do we recognize the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven? Do we seek it that the kingdom has come near to us? We've got a lot more to cover in Matthew. We're just finishing up this week kind of, you know, in the mid-teens and Matthew's a lot longer, 28 chapters. We've still got to go through a lot more teaching, a lot more going on in Jerusalem, the passion, the resurrection, the differences in those accounts from what we heard in Mark, what we will hear in Luke and John. What's different about the risen Christ? How is the body of Christ described? How do we live into that description? There's a lot going on here. It's my hope that by the time we finish this course, having paid attention in Mark and Matthew and Luke and John, we'll be in a position to start making those connections throughout the liturgical cycle in ways that allow us to follow more faithfully. I hesitate to say better, but let's just say more faithfully. Comments or questions, reactions. What have you heard new tonight that you kind of went, oh, I didn't know that about Matthew, or I didn't see the contrast with Mark, or what what has leapt out at you about Matthew tonight?
this listing of um, the treasure, the pearl, and the dragnet, I don't recall hearing that term for dragnet. Oh, that's when he says that the kingdom of heaven is like, you know, casting a net into the sea and the angels draw the net in and they cast oh, aside okay. the, you know, they keep some of the fish and throw the other right. ones away. Right. So in other words, there's a process of winnowing that goes on here. Uh, the, uh, we know about the, the, the wheat and the tares. We remember the parable of the sower. Uh, these are very powerful images that once we get, we, they're going to stick with us, right? Mm -hmm. Now notice also in the parable of the uh, weeds and the wheat, or the wheat and the tares, however you want to call it. Now let's just go there in chapter 13. Pages to turn here with clumsy fingers. Uh, I'll just read it. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, again, Jesus is instructing us in how to be the church. So when we see people who we say, an enemy has done this, you know, Satan has sown weeds in our midst. Uh, we're tempted to go to the master, to God, and say, uh, you want us to go and gather them in? And what does God say? No, let me deal with that. Let them grow together with you until the harvest, and I will send my reapers. Which means what, in the meantime? Judge. Well, we have to live with them. Yeah. And in the meantime, continue to witness to them of the good news of God in Christ Jesus. Because it's just conceivably possible that somebody who's been placed in our midst by an enemy might be converted by our testimony. God might use us to do that, right? Uh, if we are poor in spirit, it's probably more likely. We didn't talk about blessed are the meek. What does being meek mean? Humility, isn't it? Yeah, but humility has a bad ring to it now. Being humble is thought of as being a doormat for Jesus. It's not. It's not. It's again recognizing that God is God and I am not. It's also recognizing that I am looking not to satisfy my own will amongst others. I'm looking to discern God's will and do it, including in how I interact with others. It's not being a doormat for Jesus. That's the culture telling us that. We don't want to be Uriah Heep, right? I'm an humble man, sir. What an humble man I am, right? That's the other image we have of humility, of a sort of obsequiousness, somebody sucking up to you. That's not Christian humility. Christian humility is to say, God first, others second, me last. I think I've said this in a prior class. I think it was Pius X who assumed as one of his titles as Pope, Servant of the Servants of God. What a great title for a Christian leader. Would that any one of us in ministry could live in that title, Servant of the Servants of God. That's humility, well, regardless of what you might think of Pius X. It's certainly a, a humble sentiment. Now, on that happy note, we'll go ahead and close for the week. Uh, next week, we will continue in Matthew. I think it's going to take us more than two weeks to get through Matthew. We 
took two weeks to get through Mark. I think we're going to be into a third for Matthew, so we'll, we'll be there for a while. But we'll find out next week. Let's go ahead and pray. The Lord be with you. With Spirit. Heavenly Father, we pray that we may experience the blessedness that your Son speaks of in the Sermon of the Mount by so recognizing your grace that we are compelled to place our own wills after yours in all things. Be with us as we go forward to continue to dive all the more deeply into your holy word. Let it soak into us that we may literally incarnate your loving word. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.